As Liberia braces up for its 2023 presidential elections, candidates are leaving no stone unturned in making sure that President George Weah does not win a re-election. And while the opposition parties are plotting his ouster, President Wea is not resting on his oars as he makes efforts to retain power for another six-year term. Joining us now to speak on his strategy to win the number one seat in Liberia is one of the frontline candidates from the Alternative National Congress, ANC, Alexander Cummings. Good afternoon and great to have you here Good on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. My, my pleasure. All right, so we're here to assess your chances in, you know, the next year's presidential election, given the fact that you're running against the current president, George Weah, who is seeking a second term in office. Uh, how do you feel about this? Um, I feel very confident okay. that uh, we will replace President Weah and make him a one-term president, primarily because of his performance, his track record over the past five years. Um, you know, when he ran in 2017, he was very famous, he was a footballer, didn't have a record to run on. Uh, over the last five years, uh, the economy is going the wrong direction, Liberians are suffering, unemployment has increased. And so for all of these reasons, and because the governance in our country has deteriorated, uh, I think uh, we're very confident that we can make the case to Liberians to replace him in 2023. All right, when you contested in the 2017 election, you scored just 7% of the total votes. How much groundwork have you done since then to ensure that the part is a little bit smoother than the last time out? Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of work in the last five years to make our case uh, to Liberian people. Um, and when we look at current polling in the country, because we do continuous polling, uh, there are three candidates, top candidates, the president, the former vice president, and myself. Uh, and so it shows that we've made tremendous progress. Some of the folks that ran in 2017 are no longer uh, running in, 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 uh, in 2023. Uh, but most importantly, we have traveled the length and breadth of Liberia. We've made our case to Liberian people. Uh, and the polling shows that, um, you know, we are in the hunt, if you will. And with the next 14 months to go, we're confident uh, that we can succeed him. Okay, so there are reports of infighting among the various opposition coalition groups, including the collaborating political party, CPP, to which your own party, Alternative National Congress, belongs. Have you been able to resolve your differences with former Vice President Joseph Bokai, or are you considering a new coalition, or maybe going into the race all alone? So we are considering a new coalition. Uh, in fact, we just uh, recast, if you will, the CPP, a new framework agreement uh, with one of the larger parties in Liberia. And we're in discussions with other political parties and individuals to come and join us to craft a new, a new coalition. Uh, of course, it'll be helpful the more we can consolidate the opposition. And I'm confident we may not get all the opposition parties together to support us, but we'll get most of them to support us in 2023. And uh, speaking of those opposition parties, if perchance you were asked to uh, step down for the former Vice President uh, Bokai, I am hoping I pronounced that right, or any other alliance candidate uh, to ensure the defeat of President Weya, would you consider that? Look, we'll consider anything in the interest of the country. But what I often say to that question is that um, you don't enter a race or a competition planning for failure right. or planning to come in second. Uh, you enter, I, I, I don't plan for a plan B. Uh, we focus on the objective and we deal with reality if and when it happens. Uh, but we're very confident and not being overly confident. Of course, we have a lot of work to do, but we are confident that um, we can make our case to Liberian people we can bring together many of the opposition parties. And on that basis, I think we can replace President Weah. And again, I remind people that his performance has been just abysmal. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but the United States government just sanctioned uh, three top officials oh, wow. in the government uh, for corruption. The Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, the President's Chief of Staff, has been sanctioned by the United States government. The Solicitor General of Liberia has been sanctioned by the United States government and so as the head of the National Port Authority, all for corruption. 
Um, this is damaging to the president, the, the government. Uh, he has not reacted uh, in the right way to the seriousness of the, of the allegations. Uh, another reason why I think uh, we have a, a wonderful opportunity to replace him and restore good governance uh, to our country. All right, some, some would regard you putting you side by side with George Opongwe, who is just an international figure known all over Europe, celebrated. As some would say, you are a political um, novice, so to speak, understanding that in the last election in 2017, uh, you didn't get as much vote as some would have said would have been impressive from your political bloc and also from your tribe. So we entered politics literally 18 months prior to elections, only 18 months. Bef before then, I had not been in politics. We came in f the fifth out of our 20 plus candidates. We came in third in so the- So that means they're right, in, in, in the, in it's still politically new. Yeah, but, but the point is we made tremendous, in 18 months, in the speaker's political county, Liberia is organized by counties, 15 counties. We came in third ahead of many other politicians who have been there forever. In six of the 15 counties, we came in second. After only 18 months in politics, is now five, will be six years later. We have made tremendous strides, and again, I go to the polling we've done across the country, and it says we made significant strides, and a lot of the old politicians have stepped aside, are no longer competing. Uh, we're gonna build a coalition around me. We're offering new ideas. Liberia needs to do things differently. Our country is 175 years old, and yet one of the least developed countries in Africa. I keep saying you cannot keep doing the same thing and expect different results, and that message is resonating with Liberians. So I'm not confident because I, I say so, the facts support it, uh, and the progress we've made uh, supports that as well. Well, I know that you've been endorsed by some women groups, and while reacting to their endorsement, you spoke of a lot of challenges that you would like to fix, like the need for improved schools, better healthcare delivery service, lifting Liberians out of extreme poverty, and so many other issues. But I'd like you to share details, you know, of how you're going to address these challenges. Sure. So the first, way we have to, first thing we have to do to address the challenges is we have to find the resources, the money to do that. Otherwise, it's just talk, as I always say. And so we are going to do the following things to try to find the money. First, we're going to stop the stealing. Uh, the corruption, right, and redeploy those resources into these areas we talked about. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on the private sector. So I grew up in the private sector, if you will. You know, I ran Coca-Cola Nigeria, so I'm very familiar with this, this country. I ran Coke Africa. Uh, I had a global responsibility for, for the company in many functions around the world. So I understand the private sector. I understand how to attract foreign direct investments. I understand what to do to encourage businesses. And through that process, we'll generate the revenue necessary to invest in education, in healthcare. The other thing we'll do different from what other politicians do is we're gonna make choices. We're gonna prioritize. We're not gonna try to fix everything on day one. Because when you do that, you do every, a little bit of everything and you do nothing well. And so we're gonna focus in education, for example, we're gonna focus on teacher's training and vocational training. In healthcare, we're gonna focus on primary healthcare because what kills most Liberians are very basic things, malaria, typhoid, hypertension. So these are the things we'll do differently, but we'll find the resources, we'll make choices, we'll prioritize, and we'll begin to fix uh, Liberian challenges and problems. We're gonna privatize many of our state-run institutions because again, governments are meant to create the right environment, not to actually run institutions. So we'll, private sector investments is another way we'll fix some of these challenges uh, our country faces today. All right, well, it seems very well thought out on your part, but um, let's go to a little bit of the controversial. You were recently exonerated um, by the courts of charges of forgery and uh, criminal conspiracy. Of course, you maintained your innocence all throughout. And um, are you of the opinion that somehow the government might be using the court system in a way to suppress those who could be big candidates to go up against the presidency? Or is this just something that uh, uh, people are saying? No, the, the government will use every means they can to stay in power, including using the court system. Uh, the accusations against me were, were bogus. 
uh, they were false and I was exonerated. And by the way, the Solicitor General of Liberia, the Chief Prosecutor, was the one prosecuting me. This was a misdemeanor, not even a felony, right? But he was prosecuting me, and he's one of the ones that was sanctioned by the U.S. government. Um, and so it, it says and speaks to the bogus nature of the accusations against me, because one of the reasons why he was sanctioned uh, was because he suppressed, not just in my case, suppressed evidence that exonerated me. Um, so the government has tried to use that means. We believe they will try to use that means, uh, but we're prepared uh, to call them out when they do, uh, because we know librarians will not accept or tolerate uh, the use of the judiciary to keep uh, politicians uh, from their constitutional right to compete against the president. All right, you've been very critical of George Oponwe and his administration, and it's time you've actually called to question his leadership style, you've accused him of mismanaging state resources. If you become president, what would you do differently? Or what, what approach should the state be taking to ensure Liberia is a better nation than it is right now? Right. A great question. And, and, and by the way, um, I, 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 I don't criticize President we are just because I want to replace him. I do want to replace him. The, the facts speaks to the criticism. By any objective measure, right, unemployment, inflation, all your human development indexes are all going backwards. Fact, right? Uh, but what will we do different? Uh, first of all, we'll restore integrity to the leadership of Liberia. You know, I've had the opportunity to literally manage billions of dollars uh, in my corporate life. Um, in, because I always say the best predictor of future behavior, future performance is past behavior, past performance. And so if you look at my past behavior, past performance, you will see that I've delivered results. Um, I've set goals and achieved them. I've built strong teams. I've managed with integrity. Um, I don't make commitments I can't keep. Uh, so we'll do all of these things differently. We'll build the right team of people. We will invest in the right things. We will ensure integrity in governance. Um, we will change the dynamics of how our country has been run uh, historically. And so for all this, I'm the only president running, person running who has had the experience I've had in the private sector. Because I strongly believe that the private sector will be one of the key drivers of change in Liberia. We've been too dependent on this thing called government, and government has a key role to play. But we will make sure we embrace the private sector, create the right environment for the private sector to thrive, create jobs, generate new taxes. We need to invest in tourism in my country. We have 350 kilometers of beaches, so ecotourism can thrive in Liberia. Uh, and so we'll do many, many things different, but we'll make choices in terms of how we go about doing that. Now, earlier you talked about um, stopping the stealing once you get into government, but that sounds very familiar. I mean, almost every African politician wants to fight corruption. And Correct. at the end of the day, it's same old, same old. So I'd really like to know how you plan to stop the stealing. How do you plan to fight corruption? How do you plan to tackle security, you know, the security challenges in Liberia, such as armed robbery, lawlessness, you know, just tell us a bit more specifically. Yeah, so um, first thing I would say to you is that uh, one of the reasons why corruption thrives, not just in Liberia, and I like the fact you stealing because corruption makes it elegant. People steal, right? They're rogues. Um, it's because there are no consequences for people who commit these acts. And I, I say to Liberian people, I say to people supporting me, there will be consequences for people who steal Liberian people's money. I also say, as a leader, I will set the example. If you cannot tell folks not to steal if you're, if you're corrupt yourself, or the people in your immediate circles are corrupt. So we'll make sure that I set the example, people around me set the example, and when people steal, they will be punished. We will go after them, we'll go after the, the, their assets. We'll also make sure we, we make things very complicated. I'm, I don't know about Nigeria, but in Liberia we do. And when you make things complicated, you create opportunities for people to use that complexity to extract rent, to steal. We're going to go on a mission of trying to simplify things. We're going to also make sure we are paying civil servants a living wage. We did the math, the arithmetic, what the teachers make by the middle of the month, their funds are almost gone. So at the very elementary level, they will take money to change grades. 
or if you don't pay police people enough to support their families, they will pull you over, right? Because there's corruption all through the system. But at the senior levels, we'll set the example and there will be consequences for it. And in our political institutions, when we, people, because the corruption is everywhere, we punish people. They lose their roles as an example of what will happen when we, when we assume state power. All right, sounds good. Um, now you've spoken passionately about the fact that uh, Liberia needs to conduct uh, a census before they can go into the uh, election period. Uh, have you seen anything on the part of the government that shows that they're serious about conducting these, uh, this census, especially since it's so close to the elections, it's only seven months away? Correct. So the government has delayed uh, conducting a census, which is constitutionally they should not have done that. Now they're saying they're going to start the census process uh, in October, and okay. it should, should be concluded uh, by February, March. The, the concern is that because of the corruption and the lack of integrity across the government, there are concerns that that process will not be conducted uh, with the level of integrity that it should be. So we will do our best to try to monitor uh, that process, to call out any, any uh, situ situations that we think are inconsistent with the, the rules and regulations, but they have committed now to, to fund the censors. It's supposed to start, I suggest, in October, uh, albeit late, much later than it should have happened, and we just gotta make sure we monitor it so the consensus actually reflects the reality of the change in the demographics of our country. All right, talk to us about a pressing issue happening right now in Liberia regarding to a new bill that's, that seeks the approval of the legislature before they can before they can approve the retirement of electoral, electoral magistrates. Some are saying that this is a constitutional and it's almost going to fester violence in Liberia. What do you say to this? Well, I hope it doesn't fester violence. You know, Liberia has had a history of civil wars and uh, which has really destroyed the fabric of our country. And, and um, I, I, I hope that we do or say nothing that will cause that to happen. Uh, but it is indeed a risk. Um, but yes, the, the point though, uh, I think how I mentioned earlier about the, using the courts to affect the elections, this is another opportunity we think the government may be using to change the magistrates. Uh, I don't think constitutionally the legislature can do that. There is some debate occurring in the legislature about whether or not they have the right to make these changes. Uh, we have called that out. We're gonna be pushing back if we need to get folks to protest against it, we will. Because again, it's another attempt, I believe, to influence the outcome of the election by tampering with the National Elections Commission by changing the magistrates in the counties that monitor the election process. Um, I hope the, the Liberia has two branches in the election, Senate and the House of Representatives. Yeah. Has been proposed in the Senate. I don't think the House will pass it. I hope they don't. Uh, so I hope it doesn't come to pass. Okay. Now, you talked on um, Liberia's past in terms of the Civil War, and I know that the 2023 election will mark the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Accra Comprehensive Peace Agreement to end the Liberian Civil War. Now, I'd like to know what progress has been made in terms of national healing, reconciliation, and, you know, probably economic prosperity since then, and what you're going to do to foster that. Yeah, look, some progress has been made. It would be unfair and incorrect to say that we haven't made some progress. I think uh, historically, typically when you pass the 10th year mark after a civil war, it's typically a milestone. Uh, it's a good sign that things have settled. And of course, as you say, we, we're pushing it year 20. So we passed that. That happened under Mr. Sirleaf, the prior administration. Um, but more progress needs to be made. Um, we have never really brought many of the perpetrators of war crimes to justice. So one of the things we're advocating is for war, a war economics crime court to actually look at economic crimes that have been committed, uh, war crimes and, and, and punishment, uh, bring punishment to those people who committed those crimes. Um, so we've made some progress, but uh, a lot more can be done in terms of reconciliation, in terms of acknowledging the hurts and the, the pain we've caused uh, Liberians. I think we can do a lot more work in that regard. And, and because we've not brought to bear true justice. I think it's why the, this era of impunity continues in our country where you can do, say, anything against the law and get away with it. Uh, and it's something, again, we're determined to do to restore the rule of law 
into Liberia to, to invest in the, in the judicial system. Because even as I talk about private sector growth, unless you have rule of law, you have a judicial system where there's sanctity of agreements, you're not gonna attract the private sector. And so those are fundamental things we'll have to fix, reconcile ourselves and our people. Liberia is only five million people. I think Lagos is over 20 million, right? Mm -hmm. Greater Accra <laughs> is over five million, right? We have to do some work to work to, I remind us Liberians that you don't pick your tribe, you don't pick your religion, you're born into, you don't pick your gender. Those things should not separate us, right? Um, easier said than done, but we have to have those conversations to bring our country and our people together. Well said. And speaking of those conversations that need to be had, we know that the population of Liberia was drastically depleted uh, after the war, and we know that they were scattered all over the uh, world. So. In terms of working or collaborating with other nations in the diaspora, even Nigeria, since you, uh, you said you spent quite a bit of time in the public sector here, um, what are your plans in order to get collaboration from some of these other nations in terms of investment and improving uh, the economy for uh, the Liberians? Sure. So two things I would say to that. One is Liberia has a large diaspora mm -hmm. uh, because of the war, all right, all right? both in the United States and Europe. Liberians are in Australia, they're everywhere, right? Um, and actually, if elections were held today in the diaspora, I'll win. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious, no competition there. So we, we want to encourage Liberians to invest back in Liberia. We want to create an environment for them to do that because we have to start with, with us, right? But then beyond that, one of the reasons why I'm here today, uh, at this, this, these few days, is because I have relationships in Nigeria. Uh, and I want to encourage Nigerian businesses to think about coming to invest in Liberia. We're in the sub-region, we're part of ECOWAS. Similarly, uh, I will be visiting Ghana, we'll be visiting Ivory Coast, because before we even go to the West, we, I think we need to start in the sub-region. And again, Nigeria has 180 million people, big banks, big businesses. We want to encourage them to look within the region. Uh, and then of course, we'll look at the Americans and the Europeans who come back to invest in Liberia. But I want to start and focus on, on the region, uh, including diaspora and Liberians, wherever they may be. Here in the West, they have resources, they've done well, they can either come home to help or they can send us their money and we'll invest it on their behalf and give them a return. All right, um, you've spoken passionately about the need for Liberia to conduct a census for the election. Um, the government has decided in their wisdom to put it in March of 2023. That's just a few months before the election. Do you think this is enough? Has this have a lady of years in any way? Um, it, to some extent it has. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, it will start in October. It will be done, I think, about February. And then you, because it's based on that, we have voter registration because we have the read market districts. The population has grown. So it, it's good that they're going to do the, the census. It's unfortunate they waited so late to do it. Uh, and we express some concerns about the, the, the integrity of that process. But you know, I'm, I'm a very practical person. It is what it is, it is gonna happen. We'll try to monitor it, to ensure it goes the right way. Um, and then we'll work to try to make sure the results of the census is reflected in the re-demarcation of the country and the various constituencies, et cetera, et cetera. But some concerns, uh, but unfortunately we are where we are and it's gonna happen under the current circumstances. Now, apart from Liberia, Nigeria and Sierra Leone will also be holding their general elections in 2023. Now, I'd just like to have your thoughts on how these three countries you know, can achieve free and fair election, devoid of violence, voter intimidation or harassment, especially when you consider the fact that some countries in Africa have started experiencing military takeovers. So how can we prevent such in these three countries? Yeah, um, it's, it's an excellent question um, that we... Uh, Nigerians, Sierra Unions, Liberians who are going to election is really incumbent upon the leadership of our various countries to ensure fair and free elections. In the case of Nigeria, you don't have an incumbent running. You have two uh, non-incumbents. So it should be in the interest of the government, even though their party is, has a candidate, to ensure free and fair elections uh, because of the risk of violence or the military coming back to power. I think the same is true in, in Sierra Leone and of, obviously in Liberia coming up next year. Um, so um, it is in our political, economic interest 
the whole free and fair elections. And I'm reasonably confident it'll happen. Look, it will not be perfect. Um, but Nigeria has gone through several elections where peaceful transfer of power. And you could argue maybe about some problems that happen. Same with Liberia, same in Ghana. Um, so I don't have a, a magic bullet, a silver bullet in terms of answering that. But, but I do think we recognize and realize that it's in our interest, our country's and people's interest to have free and fair elections. And so I'm hopeful that happens in, in the three countries uh, coming up. And you mentioned the examples, what happened in Mali with the coup taking over. I hope those are examples as to what not to do uh, uh, so that we don't get the consequences of that. And Guinea, you know, similarly had a, a military took over. And those consequences, uh, lawlessness, crime, insecurity, these are things we are all quite aware of. Um, Liberia is definitely struggling with those, and it's definitely linked to uh, poverty and uh, the inability of people to make a living and uh, go about their lives as they want to. How would you address those situations? And does that make you scared? Um, do you have any fears for your own safety going into the elections, knowing that sometimes these things can be quite uh, unsafe. Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't, the lawlessness that's happening, poverty is a contributor, mm -hmm. no question about it, but I think it's, it's the environment you create that makes a difference. So in the case of Liberia specifically, uh, um, <clears throat> the, this government has politicized the police uh, force. Um, what we, what we would do different is we'll have professionals run the, the police uh, organization. We'll make sure they're properly resourced to do the work. We're not going to politically prosecute anybody. Uh, because, and then you have to give people hope. The, the, the broader population, people have to see progress, however small in their lives. Um, those are things we, are, we have to do differently across the continent, right? So those people who commit crimes have to be punished. There has to be consequences. Um, then you have to give people hope. I mentioned earlier, you gotta pay people a living wage. So the choices we make, the priorities we make, the examples you set is what would influence safety and security in the country. Without that, nothing happens. Uh, our president said we should all get CCTV. That was his answer, literally, his own tape, right? That cannot be the solution from the head of state. Because fundamentally, your, one of your primary responsibilities is to ensure uh, the safety and security of, of, of the country. And so we make sure the police is, has the resources and need to enforce the laws. We make sure we invest in our people in, in human capacity and human potential. Uh, we make sure our people are hopeful that their children and their future will be brighter than theirs. And if you do those things, you begin to reduce uh, uh, crime. And All right, the um, talk to me about she spoke about free and fair elections, but vote buy is becoming a big issue in Liberia. As we are seeing lawmakers engaging in one term vote buy, literally, to try to garner support for themselves. Ahead of the 2023 general elections, do you think the electoral body is doing enough to curb vote buy? Are you afraid that those with deep pockets might be able to sway the electorate their way? That, that, that is clearly a risk. Um, and I think I will be Pollyannish to say that it doesn't exist or that the Elections Commission has the capacity to stamp it out completely. Um, I think they will, they will work hard to try to reduce the amount of sort of vote buying, if you will. Um, I think it's an, an unfortunate reality of the political situation, not just in Liberia, actually, but across the continent. Um, so it is an issue. Uh, it is a concern. Um, we can only encourage the elections commissions to do the right thing, but we will also monitor. We will build our own capacity to monitor and therefore report and call out when that is happening. Um, because one way to minimize it, at least, is to surface it, to make it visible, to make it known that you in your constituency are buying vote or you're trucking people from one district to the other, uh, that shining the light on it tends to reduce uh, the likelihood of that happening. Uh, so unfortunately, I think some of that will happen in Liberia, but we hopefully it'll, it'll, 
at the, of course, at the presidential level, um, th that, that's also a risk. But we're going to do everything we can to monitor it, to call people's attention to it, to shine a spotlight on it, if you will, and to support the National Election Commission in their attempts to reduce uh, the, the lack of integrity in, in the electoral process. All right. Well, talking about the nation's election commission, some people like the former Vice President Boakai, they've questioned the integrity and the impartiality of that commission. Do you also have concerns or fears about the integrity of the commission? I, I, we, we all do have in the opposition have some concerns about the integrity of the commission. Um, and, and, and that's a generalized uh, accusation, if you will. There are individuals on the commission, in the institution, who are doing the right thing, want to do the right thing, but in general, they, they are, those concerns exist. I mean, I'll give you another fact. Um, constitutionally, the president has the right to appoint all of the commissioners of the elections process. But historically, what the former president did was she asked the opposition to identify candidates, and she had actually appointed candidates from the opposition to the commission. There are seven commissioners that run the election process. Um, because it was an attempt to assure some balance, some, some fairness. So of the seven, three were oppositions in the last administration. Um, the current president, the current commissioner was actually appointed by the current president when she was in opposition. She's not chairman, which is fine. I mean, that's the way the problem. This president who has appointed all his partisans to be uh, commissioners, right? Shows the contrast between the last administration and this one. So there are general concerns about it. Uh, again, there are individuals in there who are gonna to try to do the right thing and we'll try to support them in the right way who can. But that concern does exist about whether or not the elections will be managed with integrity. All right, well, we are almost out of time. I just want to uh, ask you if you have anything to say to Liberians who are out uh, of the country and around the world, uh, the, the reasons why you would be the best presidential candidate uh, for the, and you know, how you would run Liberia for the next couple of years? Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to have the, the conversation. Great questions. You, your research uh, has been quite good about the issues uh, we're faced with in Liberia. First of all, I want to give Liberians hope to say that, you know, we've gone through a lot of challenging and difficult times. We are re a resilient and tenacious people and we can change our country. Liberia deserves better, and we can make a difference if we make the right choices. I will also say to them that of all the candidates running, because our biggest challenge in Liberia is economic, is to grow the economy, to create jobs. Uh, and, and by doing that, we can fix many of the other challenges we have in our country. I'm the candidate with the most experience in the private sector. I understand the private sector, I understand the economy, I studied finance, I studied economics, I've lived it, I've done it successfully, and we can bring these skills to bear to grow our country. I, I, I describe the economy as this bowl of rice. We eat rice as our stable in Liberia, right? And that bowl of rice has been static or shrinking. Human nature, when that happens, everybody's gonna fight to put their hand in to get their share. We need to grow that bowl of rice. And every Liberian has to believe they can put their hand and get their share. Only two things should limit their ability. One, you gotta follow the rules. And two, if you're lazy, you're not gonna eat a lot. If you work hard, you'll eat more. That's the kind of Liberia we wanna develop. Grow the bowl of rice, grow the economy, create opportunities, and every Liberian has to believe they can have their share of that. We are the only candidate with the experience, with the knowledge, with the background, that can promise Liberians that and that it can believe uh, we can make happen. I want to say many thanks to you, Alexander Cummings, Thank you. of the Alternative National Congress in Liberia. We wish you all the best Thank you. in the coming polls. Thank you. Great. Thank you.